Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here in today's celebration of Women's History Month. Over the last year, we have seen women, and particularly women of color, continuously make sacrifices to keep both our economy and our families afloat. However, women's leadership throughout our nation is not acknowledged or nearly celebrated enough, and that is why I am absolutely thrilled to be in the virtual presence of so many powerful advocates, so many powerful women who are working tirelessly to close the digital divide through both their research and advocacy as people who live at the intersections of diverse identities. The leaders here today know the importance of advancing inclusive, thoughtful solutions that center on our most marginalized communities. However, as I'm sure we'll be discussed today, and I'm excited about today's conversation. Inclusive solutions are only effective if we properly define the problem. We need research, quantitative and qualitative, that assists us in better understanding the scope and depth of the digital divide, as well as the community-centered policies that are needed to best address this persistent inequity. The digital divide has morphed into a monstrous COVID-19 divide that has left families across this nation in distress as they search for affordable solutions to education, access, work, healthcare, and government services that have shifted to an online format. And more than one year into the pandemic, millions remain offline in tribal, rural, and urban communities, and they are forced to plan their days sometimes around trips to the top of that hill or to that library or that restaurant in order to access the internet. It is clear that we must act with a sense of urgency to implement solutions that ensure people can access affordable, reliable broadband from their homes, both during this pandemic and after we make it through these unprecedented times. For my part, the FCC is working hard on a few solutions, one of which is the emergency broadband benefit, the EBB, which we expect to roll out to consumers by the end of April. This benefit will provide a discount of up to $50 per month towards broadband service for eligible households and up to 75 per month for households on tribal lands. These households critically can also receive a one-time discount of up to $100 to purchase a connected device such as a laptop or tablet. And if we are successful, and we must be, the emergency broadband benefit will reach more disconnected, low-income households and people of color than any previous FCC effort to close the digital divide. However, I do note that it is a temporary fix to a long-term problem that requires permanent solutions because income inequality will remain here after we put this pandemic behind us. And so I'm hopeful that because we have this unparalleled opportunity, we can boldly address these issues of equity and inclusion in this nation. I wanna be able to look back at this moment and know that we made real the promise of accessible and affordable broadband for all. And as things currently stand, there's too much at stake. And there is a lot of continued uncertainty, especially for women of color looking to rebound from the economic fallout caused by this public health crisis prior to the pandemic Black women and Latina women became an economic force as they overcame structural barriers to create thriving businesses. And as small businesses holistically have also struggled to stay afloat, we have learned that entrepreneurs' ability to digitize access to their goods and services alongside consumers' ability to navigate these online services will impact these businesses and their ability to recover. Our failure to close the digital divide will mean that we're erasing years of progress. It's time, it's past time, that we recognize that when our most marginalized communities um, uh, fail to thrive, uh, the nation is also hurt. We must continue to make sure that the nation benefits for all. The future is uncertain, but I do know that the panelists here today are going to continue to work diligently to make closing the digital divide a reality in this nation. I truly look forward to today's dialogue, the ongoing uh, collaboration, and I wanna thank each of you uh, for your continued leadership in this space. And to that end, we have a, uh, I am so proud to be able to co-host this event today. 
I want to turn it over uh, to uh, our co-host there, the Assistant Secretary, Evelyn Romali, the Acting Assistant Secretary for Commerce, uh, for her remarks today. Thank you for the partnership both today and the ongoing partnership. Uh, um, to you, Evelyn. Commissioner Starks, thank you so much. That was just so on point. Uh, this is such an urgent issue and we're just so pleased to be partnering with the FCC today and to welcome the panelists and to have Dr. Al Kaswani leading today. So thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be able to join you today. I want to thank Commissioner Starks again. I'm just so excited about this particular topic. We know how women of color and their thought leadership have shaped the internet landscape from day one. But what excites me about today's discussion is that it is looking to the future. How do we target our research to bring the next wave of unconnected Americans online? Let me welcome our panelists and thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts. Let me also thank Francine. Dr. Elkaswani has worked tirelessly to build NTIA's Minority Broadband Initiative or MBI from the ground up. It's a testament to that hard work that the recent Consolidated Appropriations Act codified the MBI as an office within our agency and directed us to continue supporting minority serving institutions and their efforts to expand access to broadband. That law also included a number of grant programs that will be implemented by NTIA. The Connecting Minority Communities Pilot Program will direct $285 million to HBCUs, TCUs, and other minority-serving institutions. The grants will fund the cost of internet service, equipment, and hiring IT staff. Another program focuses on tribal governments with 1 billion in funding to be used for broadband deployment on tribal lands. The program will also fund telehealth, distance learning, broadband affordability, and digital inclusion. A third program directs 300 million toward broadband infrastructure deployment in areas that lack broadband, especially rural areas. We are all hands on deck in the Commerce Department as we work to get these programs up and running and the money out the door. We'll have a lot more information on these in the coming weeks and months, including a series of webinars next month. Today's webinar is terrific in so many ways, but particularly because it focuses on research. Reliable, Meaningful data and research are the starting point for any solution to the digital divide, including our grant programs. In addition to our ongoing research on internet use that NTIA conducts in partnership with the Census Bureau, for the past few years, NTIA has been building out a national broadband availability map by working with states and private researchers, as well as the FCC and many other federal agencies. Last month, we announced that 30 states are now participating in the NBAM. The NBAM is quickly becoming an essential platform for informing policymakers and programs that expand internet access, and we're very excited about its potential. I won't take up any more time today, but for those of you who are looking for more Women's History Month virtual events, next week I'll be talking with Acting Chairwoman Rosenworcel FTC Acting Chair Slaughter and the FCBA about this very unique time in the telecom policy world. I appreciate being able to join you today and to talk with you and I look forward to the panel discussion. And with that, let me pass it back over to Commissioner Starks and then on to Francine. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Acting Assistant Secretary Romali, uh, all hands on deck. I could not agree more. And so uh, without further ado, um, uh, I would like to introduce the co-host for today, the moderator for today's event, Dr. Francine Al-Kiswani, who Assistant Secretary Romali just mentioned in her remarks. We cannot emphasize what a champion that she has been. She leads the work as you heard, the Minority Broadband Initiative, which is housed within NTIA. Uh, and although we're, of course, at different agencies, we see eye to eye on quite a bit, including our uh, important, necessary, mission critical work to bridge the digital, digital divide uh, through our nation's HBCUs and surrounding communities. 
Doctor, thank you so much for uh, your collaboration with me today on this event and as well for the ongoing partnership. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm humbled. I thank you, Commissioner Stark and Acting Assistant Secretary Ramallah uh, for co-hosting this event, for uh, being uh, um, supportive of our work and this particular thrust and push to rec recognize women of color who are on the forefront of, of uh, research and evaluation with respect to this technological landscape that we are, are living in. I'm just so pleased and so thrilled to be a part of this uh, celebration and to continue a collaboration with these phenomenal women. So let me get straight to the point here and not waste any time and introduce our panelists. I'm going to begin by introducing Dr. Tracy Morris, who is the executive director of the American Indian Policy Institute at Arizona State University. And she is a member of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma. And under her leadership, the um, Policy Institute provides policy analysis, tribally driven research, and economic development capacity building. Her research and publications on Native American media and the digital divide is focused on internet use, digital inclusion, network neutrality, digital and new media curriculums, and development of broadband networks in Indian country. Welcome, Dr. Morris. Thank you. Dr. Fallon Wilson, Vice President, Policy, Multicultural Media, Telecom, and Internet Council. What a mouthful. Most of us and most of you in the audience will know it as MMTC. She leads their work on sectors including technology, data policy, artificial intelligence, civil rights in the digital age, infrastructure, broadband connectivity, and digital inclusion. Prior to joining uh, MMTC, I think she's fairly new there, a few months old, Dr. Fallon uh, Wilson co-founded at Black Tech Futures Research Institute and is the former research director of Black Tech Mecca. At Black Tech Mecca, she created the Smart Black Tech Ecosystem Assessment to support local city leaders with building a thriving black tech ecosystem. And she will move further into the future. We find her right now where she is and be interested in developing assessment tools for smart HBCUs, right, Dr. Fallon? Moving on to Dr. Blanca Gordo. She is principal investigator at the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley, California where she leads a research team to conduct an evaluation of a national public policy initiative. She's also a visiting scholar at the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues at the University of California, Berkeley, and she was the academic coordinator for the Center for Latino Policy Research at the University of California, Berkeley, where she directed public policy initiatives, program development, and technology development research. Dr. Gordo is now working diligently on her book, Digital Destitution, which is the problem, we'd say, Digital Destitution, a state of disconnection from the vital economic, social, and institutional processes that depend on broadband technology. And with that definition, Dr. Gordo, would you start our critical conversation today on evaluation and research in this domain. Thank you, thank you everyone. It's such a it's such an honor and a privilege to be here before you and all the people that are listening to us today are engaging in this very important, is needs to be acknowledged formally, coded as a civil rights. That is connection to having the capacity and functioning to be able to participate today the way that we live today with technology integrated into our daily life, right? So 
digital destitution is a the theoretical proof, a concept that I created to articulate that problem that public institutions, private institutions are now starting to examine uh, and are facing. And it's a language to articulate an everyday experience facing millions of people the world over who are engaging in this process of integrating technology into daily life activities, right? But not just daily life activities. What matters here, what matters here is that technology is not, it is, I want to put forth and have been putting forth, the basis of digital destitution, right? Is the new mechanism that is both produced from pre-existing inequalities that are both social, economic, political, institutional, and have cultural outcomes, a difference, okay? So th those are kinds of pre-existing conditions of inequality. We need to examine the digital divide, not just as a device in a 2D format, but as a multidimensional, multifaceted uh, problem. And we also need to stand on solid ground so that we can design interventions and identify solutions at this moment, this crucial moment that isn't just impacting people of color, affecting their daily well, social economic well-being, not just today, not after the shelter in place ends, but for generations, mm -hmm. right? Because so when we think about the people that are not online today, you know, 10 years ago, we're 10 years old, now 20 are offline. Okay, so let me let me restate that digital destitution is a theoretical proof with documentary proof, right? But now everybody has actual proof. And it's 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 as a definition, it is the result of not preparing populations and places to manipulate that which is productive utilizing the technology to do daily life activities. Mm -hmm. right. Dr. Gordo, great introduction, great statement of the problem. Dr. Morris, how about, let's keep this critical conversation flowing here and going. How about putting some, put it crudely, meat on the bones of this theoretical structure that Dr. Gordo has not so nicely laid out for us? from your experiences and from your research, um, shed some light on, on this and some e exemplars, some examples. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate being here and I, I appreciate being with all the, the guests and the, the hosts. Uh, you know, I think it, I mean, I thank you for the, the introdu introduction, Dr. Gordo, but I think it's even more serious than socioeconomic. I think it's life or death. Um, I don't say that lightly, you know, um, in Indian country always seems to be the canary in the coal mine. I mean, we knew this existed before, but now it's, it's so visible and it is life and death in our communities. We don't have the ability to even get the information out because there's no broadband in, 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 our, in our rural tribal communities in some areas. We don't have the ability for telehealth, regardless of what kind of connectivity at this point. Um, and then there's folks who choose not to have connectivity, who are not getting access to the telehealth, or even even urban folks who can't even register right now for a vaccine because it's all set up online. So it, it's a it's a bigger issue, uh, I think. And you know, we do have some different issues in Indian country because of the extreme rural out, rurality. I can't say that today. Rurality of our communities, uh, rugged rural tribal nature. You know, nature of tribal lands is is it creates further um, divides that become difficult. Plus we're 574 nations. So that, that, when I think about research, that really creates the biggest issue when we're doing our research. We put out the tribal technology assessment a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago. And we did survey you know, tri residents and users um, on tribal lands, but the ability to go to each nation and get their distinct story creates difficulty for empirical research as, as we all know it in the, in the academy. There, there's great difficulty um, gaining that data, but the, the lack of that data means we don't actually have baseline data 
on connectivity on tribal lands. We've got, we can piece it together a little here. There's a little here of the census and there's, you know, this over here. But I mean, we've got carrier reported data, but that is, as we know, not biased data. I mean, it's not, it's not the kind of data that we do that is, rep, you know, that's the kind of research we do with replicable data. We need baseline data and we need to have accurate, um, accurate mapping that's more granular than we do now. Zip code's not always granular. We have um, issues with that with the census data. We need census questions. I think census questions that were consistent every time we did it would be extremely helpful in creating those comparative data sets that we'd be able to use just for baseline work, just for baseline work. Right. So that's that's the that that would be my follow up to the the great start that Dr. Gordo put forth. Well, I think it's interesting, and and thank you for that uh, shedding light on that very critical problem because uh, if we were able to gain and gather the kind of baseline information for Indian country, then that sort of sets the bar uh, for ex expansion into other rural areas across the United States. Uh, we've got, Absolutely. say, 85 or 86 HBCUs that are land grant institutions that serve rural areas. And I think all the tribal colleges are land grant institutions. Yep. And with those community extension centers, there, there is that capacity to, to reach those populations. But moving on, you know, we, we focused uh, the process of developing social explanations, uh, as you started here, uh, rooted in the intersection of multiple, and I want to underscore multiple, multiple social dynamics here. So one might call this the uh, intersectionality hypothesis, so to speak. Uh, and in its best incarnation, I, I think we might say it's about getting the facts right and finding the differences that matter. So, Dr. Fallon, I am, am Dr. Wilson, I'm sorry. You can Fallon. call me Dr. Fallon. <laughs> Dr. Fallon, yeah, like everybody calls me Dr. A. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Could you shed some light on that from your experiences in the trenches and, and how mm -hmm. you might be approaching it from the, the vantage point of MMTC. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be a part of this amazing discussion. I love the phrasing, the theoretical piece of digital destitution, all the way to talking about our tribal communities and how they are struggling to have access. And I just wanna give like a very small example on a very local level, right? And thinking about schools. So the pandemic happened, what, March, 2020, and communities and governments and organizations like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We close schools, right? And they said, oh my gosh, we close schools, but how are we going to teach the children, right? Mm -hmm. And so therein lies how we get some of our research. So our amazing school districts, our public school districts who are tasked with so many amazing things they have to do, now they have to become researchers to figure out how many of the students were actually connected and disconnected. I did this work on the ground in Nashville because that's my hometown. And it was a very interesting three months of trying to figure out exactly what was going on with our children in Nashville. And of course, many of my colleagues across the country who works with school districts also experience the same thing because not only are they having to figure out how to deliver education remotely, right? Not only are they having to figure out how to get food and nutrition, to our communities, but now they have to think about methodologies in order to collect data to, to see what's going on. And so many of them, not because they're not able to, they sent out surveys. They sent out surveys to families to ask if they were connected. And that is not, but once again, we don't, let me just say this, Fallon's a public education advocate to her core. We do not fund public education like we should in this country. And so you can footnote me on that one. Um, and so they did the best that they could, but we got a lot of faulty bias assessments on who exactly is connected, who has devices and, 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 and try and have made the best decisions we could. 
I share that example, that opening example, because it goes, I'm going to put the responsibility back now on the FCC, on NTIA, and the Biden administration to really figure this out. So that if we ever have another pandemic, our school districts across the country, and I'm not even talking about our other nonprofits who have to figure out who had connectivity, we lost three months. Of, of, of activation time, three months of remote learning, three months of delivering telehealth, because we didn't have the data granularly, Dr. Tracy, to really make actionable decisions. And how does it relate to my overall work? Dr. Francie, I'm glad you talked about intersectionality. I am a Black feminist to my core, also public education and Black feminist, right? Um, but I also believe that in order to really address the digital divide, you have to see it as compounding intersecting systems of oppression that keep communities of color from accessing their, their own choice, right? You don't have the internet. You can't necessarily have computer science um, as a home learning moment. Um, and you can't get a job in our amazing tech companies. You can't create a tech business. The foundation will always be about connectivity for this new economy that we're building. And so if we don't have the data to figure out how to level the playing field, right? So that we can, so that black and brown children can run into all of their innovation dreams, right? Then we have not done what I think we should do as a country, which is to make sure that all can democratically participate in the world that we're creating. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about what some of those variables are. And I think I agree with to both of the researchers on here that there are a lot of environmental factors that we don't take into when we do assessments, I mean, and how they intersect each other. Um, for instance, like one of my big things in Nashville was like, how are we gonna feed the babies? How do babies go know where the food is when they don't have access to the internet and in their homes, right? And trying to think through nutrition, connectivity, buses. Now, how can we make that work? Can we put hot spots on the buses and drive them to the neighborhoods so that the kids can only can also get Wi-Fi and a meal? And so I think we need more complicated research methodologies and we need a lot of thought experiments to think through some of this because some of this is the evaluation capacity of delivering large connectivity to unconnected people. And also, fundamentally, we don't include the voices of the people that we're trying to help. So I'll stop. Absolutely. Well, you know, you bring up an interesting uh, concept uh, or point of departure with respect to, say, the Minority Broadband Initiative. The focus there being on historically Black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, and the whole complex of minority-serving institutions. And I will give you a thought experiment here. Uh, how, how might one suggest going about a minority uh, research agenda, if you will? Uh, just think about it. If you think of all of the uh, institutions represented by those categories that I've just thrown out, we're talking about a little, little over 800 institutions, which represents what? 800 communities. However, those 800 institutions are serving nearly 3 million minority students. Each of those students represents a family, and those families also are, are, are likely uh, the students to have have siblings who are suffering from the homework gap, K through 12. And you've got those students, many of whom, if you're an HBCU student and a TCU student, you went home to online learning and you didn't have connectivity. <laughs> uh, you've got a real crisis. COVID has only shown light on this, that it isn't simply uh, that you can't get your benefits and you can't sign up for your vaccine, but you can't get your education. And this is affecting how many families in our country. So what could we suggest or propose with respect to a research agenda that could make use of this network of, of 800 institutions, so to speak, or, or, or select sample selectively if you wish <laughs> and 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 come up with a way of using these institutions as hubs research hubs uh for data collection for working uh for collective impact investing for data collection and research uh across the field what do you have 
I know you have some thoughts. You all, none of you lacks a thought. <laughs> I mean, or I, is this an idea that just is all thumbs down? Uh, what, what do you have to say? I don't Go ahead, Blanca, please. I have a lot to say, and I do want to respond to, you know, like, you know, people are like, yeah, that's so complicated, digital destitution, right? What is that? And I said, okay, you know, mandate happens, and you're being asked to stay at home. Yes. Okay, you know, you go home, and you continue to work. Yes. You go home, you check what's coronavirus, and what do I have to do, because this is the kind of thing that's going to save my life in real time, because it keeps changing and adapting to the situation. When I have to get my, you know, changes, my, get my a methadone for my opioid addiction, because now the, the, the medical association has removed the barriers to be able to be prescribed online for these things. And my addiction doesn't wait for technology or service. When you have to go home and learn and teach, and when you have to go home to apply for an unemployment benefits, when you have time to connect to your loved one who's in the hospital because you cannot visit them, when they're dying, you know, when families are gathering to love. Yeah, that's not you. That is digital destitution. Now, that how that happens, I think we need to be very rigorous and grounded in a reality to get ahead. You know, everybody, the leadership says, it's not a new problem, we knew about it. So which is it? Did we know about it and didn't know what we were doing? Or did we chose not to do something? Or what was the problem that is so fragmented here? Because there's a crisis. And like Tracy said, millions of people have died. And I think it's not incidental that they didn't have the information at a time that it matters. Exactly. Life is at stake here. But how it happens, this is just the stimulus. What the cause of digital divide, the cause of digital divide, the inability to participate, to compete, to, to prosper today, you know, requires being online, development. What is at stake here is the autonomy, the autonomy and the mobility, the opportunity mobility, and we see what happens when there's not a belief in social mobility, there is social disorder. And then we have to take into account that there are structural elements that define the limited public institutional support. I am happy that there's an emphasis on minority institutions because we need a professional class of planners that is going to you know, help our organism, community mechanism that is in charge of dealing with the inequalities that pre-exist in our society. We have, as a democratic, capitalistic society that we have, we have social responsibility guidelines. That's why the Federal Communications Commission is here. That's why we have a stimulus. Money is not the problem. It requires imagination. And we need to disrupt these old age narratives. Okay, right? then Dr. Gordo. That that that, 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 that that we're hard Dr. to reach. Wilson, to... How, how do we come up with some effective research strategies to address these disparities okay. in broadband access? Dr. Morris, you have some some thoughts. Uh, now I know <laughs> the ladies are not shy, so uh, don't let me dominate this conversation. Uh, keep, <laughs> let's keep this well, critical conversation going. Go ahead, please. I I do think that there. There definitely needs to be innovative solutions. I think that that is spot on. I think they need to be community-based solutions, and I'm betting that my colleagues would agree with me because we know our communities best. Uh, I think that the um, network of tribal colleges and historic black colleges can be a part of this, but I think it needs to go beyond that because in Indian country, there's only about 57, 60-ish tribal colleges. So that's 35. definitely not hitting all of the different um, communities, uh, right. that, you know, so, so there'd be, there would be a gap there. I think, I think that um, part of it has to be partnering and not working in silos. I think it has to be developing um, consistent uh, research questions uh, be, so that it can be cross compared, the data can be cross compared um, between communities, between um, population areas, things like that. I think it starts with some high-level thinking like that, that needs to, but it needs to come from community and organizational leaders that can sit down. I think, I really just think there needs to be, I think you're right, there needs to be an agenda and that needs to be, we need to sit down and have a dang retreat when we can be in one room <laughs> and, and map it out. I think okay. there's enough of us, we can figure that out. 
um, All right, then let's we know our communities. <laughs> Right, right. And building and building on what Dr. Tracy shared, um, I I think you know I think we should have like a moment where we all get in the room and really like deconstruct the methodologies we have used, right? That may or may not be helpful for capturing the voices of people of color. I think our survey instruments, we should, now I'm going researcher, we should definitely oversample for people of color. Um, let's be clear. If you look at many of our municipalities, and I love working mun with municipalities, many of their citywide surveys to assess attitudes around various types of challenges, they always undersample people of color. Now, the question is, why do they undersample people of color? Well, I'm glad that you asked. It's because they do not have the relationships within communities, to your point, Dr. Tracy, to be able to identify and to increase response rates, right? One of the amazing things that we did in Nashville, I'm, I'm sorry, y'all are going to have a, always a Nashville um, case study here, is that when we, when we realized, once again, that our school district was ch challenging, trying to figure out exactly how to count those who were connected and unconnected, um, a group of amazing city leaders got together and said, let's do a citywide assessment and oversample for people of color to really understand connectivity in Nashville, right? Using the amazing work that Austin has done with their broadband annual study that they do. And that's the other thing. So if the FCC wanted to talk to some folks, I would definitely talk with Nashville and with Austin about the amazing attitudinal surveys that they have conducted to try to get some notion on who's connected, how they understand connection, when they're connected, right? And so, but the challenge with it is, and what we're remedying with our methodology is that we wanted to make sure that we could represent the community voices that are actually in Nashville, right? So yes, to the African-American community, and I can definitely know the organizations off the top of my head to connect to, but we also have a large Kurdish community. We also have a large Coptic Egyptian community. And so how do you Nepalese community, right? How do you create a methodology that would, or a recruitment process, right? for focus groups and for interviews that will allow all of our, all Americans to have voice and talk about connectivity issues, right? You really right. have to work with community organizations in cities. You have to pay them to go recruit for you. And I know people don't like to talk about payment in these research processes, but you should. Why? Because they are doing a lot of tremendous work on the ground already and asking them to do a survey for you to get granular details to fill in our larger broadband mapping challenges, we should invest in their ability to be like Brookings Institute, where you know they go into cities and we finance them to do great work, right? We should finance community organizations to recruit people who look like us to take surveys and to be a part of our focus groups as we think through connectivity. As relates to the anchor institutions, HBCUs, tribal colleges, HSIs, and all the other MSI. Um, organizations we have in higher ed, whether it's in community colleges or traditional two or four year, right? They also can become amazing sites for investigative research, right? True. They, they, I mean, number one, I mean, it's like the per, it's like the perfect case scenario when you have a, a, a community, um, a, a, a minority serving institution. You have a sample right there that you don't have to go run and find, right? right. That could be representative based on the age demographic, right? Number two, they're often located in urban or in rural contexts, right, where right. they can also be harnessed to go and collect data and information, right, because that is what institutions of higher education do. And yes, and yes, higher education institutions of color do that too, not just research one universities and Ivy Leagues. I have to Absolutely. say that here. Um, <laughs> and yes. so you can harness them as anchor institutions, not only as places to to work with amazing companies and providers to provide internet, right? But they can also be sites of being able of data collection and evaluation. And we don't oh, think about HBCUs and HSIs and TC and tribal colleges in that way as we should. Um, I'm sorry, I, that was my little- Oh, I have speech. a perfect example for you. I think it's really fascinating. There are about 15 HBCUs that have GIS programs. And I just managed to, um, make acquaintance with the director of one of them, who's at Tennessee State University, actually, and uh, Department of Ge Geography, Dave, Dr. David Padgett by name. I know but, Dr. Padgett well. But the interesting thing they do is a s environmental justice program in which they send students out into the communities for ground, it's called ground proofing, I think, 
the, the data and capturing data on some of these brownfields and the social justice issues. And then those are classes and subject matter and, and instances for research for the students. And it provides the kind of data needed to help address the issue of environmental justice. That model could just as, just as well be applied to broadband justice, if you want to call it, or whatever. But using students, and especially with technology that you can send them out into the field with, um, for, for data capture and trusted emissaries that the community will accept, uh, sounds like a win-win situation yeah, to, actually, to me. I want How to about, say, go ahead, ladies. Yeah, I want to say that um, I think um, it would be great to deconstruct all this with all of you, right? Because it's it's an enigma that's not really an enigma, you know, in a way. And we have plenty uh, tools, plenty data, plenty mindset that, that we have to really focus on, like, uh, the mindset, you know, reset the mindset. Because a lot of the research has focused on individual, they, they have placed individual level effects of exclusion which is really what digital destitution is. It's about exclusion from that which is productive, from that which is useful, from what's that, 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 that which facilitates your life, from efficiency, from productivity, from time savings, from cost savings, you know, on and on. So it's, uh, so it's, it's like, it's like, it's like what, you know, my, my research, my digital destitution has disciplined me and the problem has defined the method, you know, and I, I've only been able to get in there and, um, you know, like we have data, for instance, but we have to really, you know, there's small real estate and we have to question the questions that are there. Why, why is this question in the census asking why you're not adopted and still have like this validity, reliability problem of answers such as I'm not interested, privacy concerns and affordability? Why are we, you know, what questions are we asking? How is that useful, you know? And we have taken these, these interpretations to, to say that people are not interested, therefore we have to do a campaign about telling them how interested they're not. When I ask people, when you're in a need to know basis, it really is a proxy for, I don't know, nobody has taught me and I already have stigma because of that, or I don't have the money. It, it tells me that we don't understand our communities. Our communities will tell us when we come with respect and dignity. You know, right. and we're asking questions that are, relate to them. And I want to point out, for instance, uh, asking this one. You know, and, and there was so much emphasis in the last the last administ Obama administration when there was already an investment and it was evidence based. And what are the outcomes? And we want to, you know, these are the needs, and they have to show economic benefit. And so anyways, I did work with community organizations who serve the people and they alerted me to situations. And so I was, we're working on the documenting storytelling as a form of data collection as well in documentation. And this woman had generated, uh, she was, she was, she was teaching Zumba. People started paying a dollar. They bought a computer. She put it on Facebook. More people came. It was an entrepreneurial thing. Let's catch that. I talked I to think, her. Uh, uh, Blanca, I'm so sorry, but I think you're missing a very nice point. You served as the evaluator for a project in uh, for the Foundation for California Community Colleges. Yes. With uh, largely, if not exclusively, Hispanic population, which and the students and the families, and you successfully engaged those families in that research effort so that they were free to talk to you. You have videos, you collected extensive data. I mean, that's an example of the very thing you're talking about. And you're selling yourself short. You're not selling something that you have done. And I think it's a good example for everybody. Well, to point out though, that I have to, we have to stay in that. Do we really know what's going on? Have we really understood the problem? Are we just saying these words? Because when I asked this person, what did you like the most? And I was trying to get to this answer, right? Because it was a good, good one. And she kept, she said, the camera. Oh, okay. Okay, let's keep on asking the same question. By the second time, I took note. By the third time, I had to pay attention. Why the camera? She said, because, oh, because I get to see my relatives. Because I cannot travel. Because I can't, because, because of 
because of money, because of all these resource barriers. The camera, oh yeah, I get to see like it's, I'm pretty, you know? And I get to see that. And I get to see how they get older and they get to see where I live and I don't show my mess, you know? I think today we can relate to the value of that. We did not value that at that moment. We right. wanted to define what was valuable and interesting to people. Right. We already know why it's valuable and interesting, precisely because there's public finance, precisely because there's private investment, precisely because there's integration of technology to deliver service through our VIA institutions. We ask today, why are Blacks and Latinos dying? Why are they not getting the vaccine when it's available? Oh, Tuskegee, oh, this or oh, that. You know, they're not getting direct information. They're getting not even third-hand information. They're getting seventh-hand information. Okay, right. why? Because you have to go online to, you call the line, go online, redirect it, go online. Oh, I can't get online because we don't know who you are. You don't have an account. You don't have an email. You don't have this. You don't have that. You have to depend, people who are disconnected either depend on the charity of others, depend on paying for somebody or not getting it at all. So why are we asking? Why are people not setting up the infrastructure in the home, in the anchor institutions, in the workplace, all the places that people of color live to be able to do life. And it's not an enigma. The same interest that that that, that people of color have is the same interest that we all, the collective have. Efficiency, time savings. We need to ask, how long does it take you to do the same activity to sign up for the vaccine? How many people did you have to go through? How long did it take you? Dr. Wilson wants to jump in and answer. Thank you, you so much. No, I, I, I fully agree with you, Blanca. Um, and, I, and I wanted to go back to something Dr. Tracy said um, that I think is super important as we think through all the amazing dollars that are going down, um, coming through the various initiatives at the national level. I think you're right. Developing a battery of questions that can be, that we can have comparative analysis um, so that, I mean, it's one thing for, of course, like I said, there are some good ones out there that give a foundation on connectivity in Austin and maybe Boston is doing some of that work. Um, of course, Nashville, I have to say that again, um, but it would be great if there was a robust, reliable battery of questions that can be implemented at the national level um, that can augment all the census data and all of the self-report data that companies and organizations do so that you have attitudinal data um, but the methodology on that would once again go back to the local, right? We need to identify organizations within states and with cities that can make sure that they have the relationships based on what Blanca has shared to really develop the types of response rates that we need on surveys. Right. But also, I'm a qualitative researcher at heart, too, and thinking about the depth of those discussions, not just about connectivity, but I have a whole battery of questions called, what are your aspirations? This is one thing, okay, so this depends on your research framework, right? I fundamentally believe that sometimes we're so punitive for black and brown people that they have to have connectivity so they can have jobs, so they can have tech businesses. But I also believe that we should ask them, what are their dreams with technology? What does innovation look like for them? If they had technology and it wasn't a cost issue and it wasn't a quality issue, what would they do with it? Yeah. Some of that you can get from interview questions, right? Some of that can get from focus groups, which I think we should do more of. Um, but, and also there's a lot of money to do. Can I just say that? So to Blanca's point, there are a lot of external variables that affect how, how research happens, right? It's not just the amazing questions that we have. And let's be clear, all of us are amazing, brilliant researchers, and we can come up with a research question based on theory and literature, right? But some of it has to do with all the political variables that shape it. But fundamentally, what I'm trying to say is for us to have a robust understanding um, for a level playing field on what data looks like, we need to be able to develop questions along with community members. We need them to be comparative. It would be great if it's a national survey that does that. And I know that there are dollars coming down that could help with this. But Dr. Dr. Tracy, Morris. I'll throw it back to you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Morris, you have a final comment here. So I think yes, we're wrapping the segment up. Okay, I do think that um, all these points are good, but I do think there are some differences with Indian country because we are sovereign governance, governments that work with, uh, are part of the family of governments in the United States. And so we end up, work, we need to be able to work with not, not individuals as much, some with individuals, but with tribal governments on this data because this data 
is used to measure entrepreneurship, um, access to uh, all kinds of community initiatives as well. So there's a, it's like working with Nashville, for example, as you say, or or cities and towns. So we end up work. We need to. We have a whole different level that we have to do, and that we're that the federal government, quite frankly, is obligated to work with us on under mm -hmm. the trust relationship. It, it's a, it's our treaty right uh, to have this uh, relationship with federal government. So that adds another level. But just having baseline questions. I think if anything comes out of this, I think it's the idea of having starting to formulate a set of baseline questions. That I think has to be the thing that we, we start, we can start there. That's a starting point, it's a nugget. And so I would highly encourage that we try and create a, a, a national level of, of questions, at least a starting place. I think that that would, um, that's an actual doable thing. It's a doable thing and it's a doable thing that becomes measurable and all those smart goals that we all espouse so much. So I would hope that we could start with that kind of thing, a continued conversation and perhaps a, a beginning towards baseline questions. That those, those would be my, my um, takeaways from this. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. I'm going to um, introduce our uh, rapporteur here in just a second. And she's going to, as the saying goes, take, take us home. I just want to close my final comment having drawing on something I read so many years ago, and I think it resonates. So I'm going to modify it just a tiny bit. And it's a statement from a sociologist, Anna Julia Cooper, from around the turn of the century, actually, yes. one of the fourth uh, black women to receive a PhD. Uh, but she stated, and I'm modifying her comment a bit, only the woman of color can say when and where I enter in the quiet, undisputed dignity of my womanhood, without violence and without suing or special patronage, then and there, the whole race enters with me. Those are my final words. Now let me introduce Dr. Elisa Valentine, who has so graciously uh, worked with us to make today possible uh, she serves as a special advisor to FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks, where she advises him <laughs> on broadband access and adoption policies that impact communities of color, low-income communities, and other marginalized communities. So, Dr. Valentine, I am going to pass the mic to you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the panelists. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alkaswani. Uh, for moderating the conversation today. You know, it's really great to be in conversation and be in community with uh, fellow academics and some around lawyers all day, every day. Um, but, you know, when our office was originally speaking with Dr. Alkaswani about this event, it was, we were really excited to co-host because we're an office with majority women, majority people of color, and we're thrilled to really collaborate um, because there's so many people in our office that sits at, you know, the intersections of so many identities and moreover, we care deeply about advocating for marginalized communities and ensuring that all of our voices are heard in the telecommunications as well as te technology spaces. So thank you all for your thoughtful comments um, here today. I, I was taking notes like a crazy person over here. Um, so I just want to kind of, you know, highlight a few of the major themes that, that I heard today. Uh, so number one, there was a lot of discussion about how we define uh, the digital divide. And from what I've heard, you know, the digital divide impacts every single aspect of our lives. And as the late Congressman John Lewis said, it is indeed a civil right. So I was really glad to hear Dr. Gordo bring up that language of it being a civil right uh, today. And that's something that Commissioner Starks and Marita Coley from MNTC wrote about in a civil rights op-ed uh, with various civil rights leaders um, last year in the midst of this pandemic. But we also heard our panelists today, um, Dr. Morris, Dr. G uh, Gordo, say this is a matter of life and death, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, access to life-saving information or medical resources in the midst of a global pandemic that has overwhelmingly impacted the lives of people of color. And Dr. Wilson, I, I really like that you talked about how this is a compounding systems of, of oppression that prevents people from accessing choices and opportunities. And Dr. Gordo, you kind of aligned your thoughts as well 
Um, I've never heard it phrased like this, but access to broadband is about uh, time saving, uh, cost saving, and it makes us more productive and it makes us more efficient. And, you know, overall, I would say that, you know, Dr. Alkaswani, you kind of glazed over this really quick when you were asked, when you were asking a question, but you talked about uh, this as an issue of justice. And I believe that's what we heard um, throughout the day today. Um, moreover, we heard a lot about the need for more inclusive data. Um, we need uh, a better uh, baseline data. We need consistent data uh, that can be used in comparative studies. Dr. Wilson talked about the importance of using granular data in order for us to be able to make actionable decisions. And moreover, that we need to oversample for uh, people of color. Uh, we also need community participation as well. And um, I really like the idea and you all talk, talked about uh, the role of HBCUs, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges, and universities, and how um, they can be seen as anchor institutions of sites of data collection and evaluation. I thought that was a really great point. I'm a Howard grad, so I was really uh, happy to hear that. Um, and moreover, Dr. Wilson, you talked about this um, a, a tad, and I think this is important, um, that you know we love our, our quantitative data. Um, but qualitative data matters as well because it allows us to dig a little deeper and tell stories in a different way, expose inequities and solutions in a different way. And it allows us to, you know, uh, be able to ask questions about not only what is, but what could be. Um, I would also add, um, you know, a really important point is investing in research, involving the communities in discussions. And as Dr. Alkaswani said, uh, passing the mic and not speaking for marginalized communities, but essentially uplifting their narrative. Um, you know, I would kind of close this out by saying, you know, when, when it comes to enacting policies, we also have to think about not just the bare minimum of, of connectivity, right? We should be thinking about meaningful connectivity and future-proof policies that allow people to not just survive, but to thrive in this technological era. And I think, you know, I've heard words uh, today about imagination and dreaming and aspiration. And I think that was a um, really nice phrasing. I think it's about dreaming boldly, advocating boldly. And um, also, as, as Dr. Wilson uh, mentioned, it's about asking Black folks, Latinos, Indigenous folks about what their dreams are for technology. So thank you all so, so, so much for joining us um, here today. Really appreciate it. This was a wonderful discussion, and our office really looks forward to engaging with you all in the future. Thank you for taking your time to join us here today. And thank you also to our audience members as well. Be safe, everyone. Thank you.